Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first Isqual's webinar. We're excited to facilitate this one, and hopefully this will be the first of many different uh, webinars that we have coming up. We're going to have about a 20-minute presentation. So we'll just uh, introduce ourselves a little bit. Again, this is the Let's Leave Community Driven Happiness um, <laughs> with policies, excuse me. The speakers today, we have presented Scott Cloutier, and he's our assistant research professor and senior sustainability scientist with the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. And then um, he's also a Happiness Alliance and Isqual's board member. Next presenter also is Laura Muzikanski, <laughs> and she's the executive director of Happiness Alliance at happinesscounts.org. And then my name is, of course, Jill Johnson, and I am the executive director for the International Society for Quality of Life Studies. So I'll be just uh, facilitating and monitoring this uh, particular webinar while Laura and Scott present. So to review a little bit about our intent for this webinar, uh, we primarily want to inspire and gather stories about community level happiness data gathering and its impact on policy. Um, to see tangible examples of real world uh, uh, applications of, of this research. Uh, so hopefully we'll explore some of those today. Uh, we also really want to explore the interest in future webinars or a webinar program with ISQUAL. So this is, as I said, hopefully will be the first of many um, webinars in the future. Um, and we also want to encourage all of you who have not joined ISQUALS, um, we would encourage you after the webinar to go online to isqualls.org and join us as a member. Uh, very reasonable rate, $75 for the entire year, which includes many different benefits. And that's our regular membership. We also have a discounted membership for students, uh, retired members, and also for people from developing countries at $50. We also encourage you to consider, if you haven't already, to uh, register and attend our conference, our annual conference. This year it's being held in Innsbruck, Austria. Um, between September 26th is our pre-conference date. And then 27th through the 30th will be our regularly scheduled conference. And that is available also online at isqualls2017.org. So with that, I will turn this all over to Scott. So Scott, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about what the Happiness Alliance is about. So I am a um, directing board member of the Happiness Alliance. And Laura is the executive director, as we talked about. And essentially, the Happiness Alliance is focused on providing tools and resources. Uh, it's been doing that since 2010. Uh, the main work is a happiness index that has been, has now 70,000 respondents all over the world. Um, and we're looking at different types of data in that space. And then also trainings around the index and how to use it, as well as publications. We've worked together on publications, myself and Laura and other folks. And then Laura's done a ton of work organizing different tools for individual happiness and community organizing. The idea of this webinar is trying to bring together folks that work at the community level around these indicators of happiness, learning from one another, and then thinking about how we can do things going forward. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But essentially, the Happiness Alliance, uh, we, we really envision a world where all beings can thrive and want to use this information to support that goal. So I think we'll kind of hand it off to Laura. Laura is going to share some things about the data and the methodology and these types of things as we go forward. Right, thanks, Scott. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the Happiness Alliance, our data, how you can access our index first. But um, before I do, I want to state what my intent is. I've been talking with John Hallowell about a World Happiness Report focusing on community work. So putting it out there, like the work that we're doing, some of the work that we looked at other communities are doing, we'll have a, Scott and I and some others will have a paper through Journal for Social Change, but really want to find out what you're doing um, and then to inspire work that we can do together so that we can really contribute to the movement through community level action. And I'll talk a little bit about why I feel that is so very important. So first, I'm gonna show you really briefly about our project and how you can access both our index and our data. So if you go to happycounts.org, you'll see our homepage. And then if you were to click on take the happiness survey there, you'll see there'll be places where you can log in or sign up. So it's just like any 
social media where you create a profile. And there you'll be able to access the survey. And this is what the survey results looked like for me a couple of days ago when I took the survey. So you can see when we're talking about measuring happiness that we're really looking at a holistic approach. This is based on Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index. And then we added the domain of work. So we start with the Cantrell ladder and then with the idea of being truly collaborative and contributing towards a shared index uh, we have those four questions that the United Kingdom has in their well-being index. And then you'll look and you'll, you'll see the other questions. So you can take the survey. You can also create a group. So a student of yours or you yourself as a researcher, can, and we've had this being being done, you can create a group and then you can administer that survey. So over 70,000 people have taken it. Um, and that then would say, well, what about the data? So for if you go to the four researchers page, um, you see, you, just, you can just click on that and you'll be able to access the data in aggregate as well as access the data um, for each question. Or if you would like to have the full data set, then we just ask that a person sign a privacy to keep the, the, um, the individual data set confidential, and then that's available. Many people have used that. You can also access the methodology um, that, again, an, another um, blast to be working with Scott on a methodology so that you can see where all of the questions come from and how the survey was um, formed. That's all in the methodology, and you can download that. It's in draft now. You can also download um, all of the questions for the survey. So we've had um, many people do that to form their own index or to really understand how to use that index. Everything from the United Arab Emirates has used our data to develop their, their survey to the Canadian Index of Wellbeing used, used our questions to form their index in, in Gulf in Canada. So that's a little bit about what we're providing. Scott? Yeah. So, uh, Lauren, thanks for sharing the, the review of the data. I think it might be useful for our guests if you could potentially show some different examples of ways that data have been used on the community level about ways that we use it as well. Beautiful. And to reiterate that um, these are some examples that we know about and really like to know about more to work with you, whether you're you're thinking about doing this work or you've done this work um, to to really make the case for a world happiness report being about community work. Um, so you're really, this is the last time you're gonna see our website. So if you go back to the website, you can go to show, the showcase under Happy to Community Toolkit, and there you're gonna be linked to the OECD's Wiki Progress um, page that's dedicated to our work. And I'm just gonna show you one project off of that, and that's in Creston, British Columbia, where um, the mayor of the, the city or town there brought together governments, for the four different municipal governments, as well as the tribe um, and many other of the actors in the community. They were looking to get funding from a foundation that allots funding to communities above the dam in the Columbia River. This is a, a historical fund that gives money to for towards economic development because the fish there are no fish above the, that dam um the grand Coul um sorry the um the dam on the columbia so so what they did which was very different from other communities is they used our index to identify the needs and were indeed awarded the funding and what i think is really interesting for me about this project after having worked in communities um, with happiness, the happiness index since 2010 is their 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 process. So you can access their process here um, on the OECD page, and we also uh, wrote about this in the essay for a journal for social change that will soon be published, and um, we'll let you all know when that happens. Another project I'm going to talk about really briefly, two more. One is in Seattle, where we worked in 2011. We issued our happiness a report card to the Seattle City Council. If you remember, governments were really suffering after that crash that happened in 2008, 2009, there was a lagging effect and governments were really suffering. In Seattle, our council was thinking about closing most of the community centers. Our data showed that people actually were suffering in the area of community and that community really is important to people's happiness and well-being. So they didn't close those are our community centers. 
And then we worked with refugee and immigrant immigrant communities. And um, we thought that all of, we worked with four different refugee and immigrant communities, sorry. And we thought that they would score higher in some of the areas of happiness and lower in some of the others. They scored lower than the overall population in every domain. Um, what that what I think was interesting here is, is about the interventions. They um, both communities, the Aromo community, were looking at safety and community, and they decided to take sort of take back their streets and house block parties. They had a little bit of funding to do this, so they did that monthly, cleaning up the streets and then having parties on the street to really show a presence. And then the Vietnamese Friendship Association, what they did. Um, to address, again, the sense of safety as well as trust. In Seattle at that time, we'd had a very awful situation where the police had gunned, like, just slaughtered a uh, an indigenous man. He didn't have a weapon. They just killed him. There was a lot of unhappiness with the police and, and a sense of not having safety. So what, what the Vietnamese Friendship Youth Association did is they brought together youth and the police. So they had about 300 youth and they had a, a police officer at each table. Um, and they, they did some cultural event and then sat down and just talked with the police for about an hour. So that's an example of two interventions that are um, done by different communities and that are very different ways of addressing sort of similar issues. And then the last example that I'm going to talk about in this webinar is happening in Brazil, where a woman named Susan Andrews is working with the VIO. I won't try to say it in Portuguese. But um, what they're doing is they have this amazing process where they work with with academia, with local schools, you know, um, elementary schools, as well as high schools, with the government, with the local government, and then with the community. So they train up the youth on how to conduct the survey, the youth conduct the survey, and then with the youth, the academia, the academics and the young children have a community meeting. The community decides what are the uh, interventions that are appropriate given the data, their own data, and then the government works to make this happen. And then there's continuity with um, the with the academic leaders. So two examples, one was a soccer field where children were playing in the streets and so the community felt that there really needed to be a soccer field for the children. And then the other is, is bio, biodigesters because there was a, an issue around water safety. And in that community, they worked with a, a for-profit to implement that intervention. So those are a few examples. Um, we know there's lots more and we'd like to know what yours are. So um, that's, you know, <laughs> for me, that's the real intent of this webinar is let's get, let's gather together to make these interventions clear about what's happening and, um, and inspire more. That's great. Thanks, Laura. So I, it's important, I think, so I am someone that works at the community level, but I like, I know you do, and probably many other members of ISQALS have an interest to have um, happiness as an alternative measure of to GDP and other quality of life measures. And so I think it might be useful if you would share some of those kind of ideas or examples too with the group. So we do know there's a couple of governments that are implementing happiness at the policy level. And I'll say why I think it's so important that there be community work. So the two governments that we know that are implementing happiness at the policy level at this point are Bhutan and the United Arab Emirates. Now, Something happened in December of 2016, which was the issuance of Origin of Happiness by Clark and Halliwell and Flash and, and a few others. And at the conference where really important findings were being talked about, O'Donnell um, said that governments at this point, well, let me back up just a second. Um, Durand of the OECD said that all 39 out of 40 of the countries in the OECD are now measuring happiness and well-being using essentially using quality of life indicators the, the country that's not is japan <laughs> so but 39 of 40 of the oecd countries are now measuring happiness we know that the united kingdom has been measuring happiness for quite a while now using random samplings of the entire country and yet what o'donnell says is that for governments to be able to use this data for policy purposes we need a thousand examples we need the evidence so now, in light of that, we know that UAE is going to start. Bhutan is already doing this. I'm going to show a little bit about what Bhutan is doing. Where are those thousand pieces of evidence going to come? My belief and Scott's belief that it's going to come from the community. And so that's where we feel that that's really important that we tell these stories, that we learn about each other's stories. 
So um, now I'm going to go into a little bit about what Bhutan is doing. So Bhutan has used a subjective measure of well-being, their gross national happiness index, paired that with objective measures um, three times, 2008, 2010, and then 2015. And I'm going to show you some data from 2010. The objective data here, you can see the mean income per capita by area, but essentially we'd say like by city. So Timpu is the capital and you can see that they're doing really well, right? And then you can see that Lutsu and the, yes, these other areas are not doing very well at all in terms of mean, air, mean per capita income if we decide that a higher income is better. However, we look at Gaza, you know, they're not doing as well as Thampu, but they're certainly not doing as poorly as, as Lutse. But if we look at the subjective indicator, so you see here that blue is, you know, Blue means not enough. And then if we can kind of group the, the brick red and the green together, if, if um, those people are doing pretty well. If we look at those subjective indicators, we'll see that Gaza and Thimpu have pretty much the same sense of how well they're doing in terms of being able to meet ends meet, make ends meet. So what we were hoping is that we'd have some time for discussion, but in, in 20 minutes we won't. But we'd love to hear what you think about this um, at the end of the webinar, we'll, we'll stay a little. But what I would say is that for policy makers and for community organizers and research, wouldn't it be really interesting to find out how people are meeting their needs in Gaza? And how could we take that information and then look at policies, programs, and projects that could be implemented in these places that really are suffering in all kinds of ways? So now we're going to go, and I'm just going to show you um, what a policy screening tool looks like. So this is being used both in Bhutan as well as um, in the United Arab Emirates are starting to develop. You'll, hear, you'll see here, this is available. Actually, I'm not going to go into this a whole lot, but this is available in a publication, also through the Journal of Social Change, Happiness and Public Policy, where you'll find this in Appendix C. And we worked with the Gross National Happiness and Commission to Ref sort of redefine their happiness policy screening tool so that people could use this, adopt this, and adapt this for their areas. And we know now that in the United Arab Emirates, they're, they're starting to do this. So that's another of the tools that we have available. Cool. Thanks, Laura. So you covered a little bit about community aspects and community projects working in the area of happiness and well-being measures, and then a little bit about Bhutan, which is um, higher level government aspects. and Many of our viewers may not know that you recently traveled to the UAE to essentially uh, high level talks around happiness and quality of life measures and alternatives to GDP. Uh, and I think it would be really useful if you could kind of share what things you learned there at that global dialogue. Yeah, yeah, that was an amazing experience. I had never been to the Middle East and I'd never expected to go to the Middle East. And for those of you who have been to Dubai, I, could, I, I think you, you know how pretty mind-blowing that place is. I was invited by the Minister of the State of Happiness to participate in the dialogue for global happiness. And um, the idea for that was to create a blueprint for other nations. I was at the working group for the, of course, for happiness indicators working group. <laughs> Where else would I be? <laughs> And the idea is that together we were coming up with how, how other governments could, could do this work. That said, I think what's really interesting is what's happening in the United Arab Emirates, where they really, they get it. So what they have is they have their Minister for the State of Happiness, whose office is there with what we would be the equivalent of the Prime Minister or the President. Him. And then she um, is helping him in terms of, in her office, in terms of how to measure happiness using a subjective indicator. And I imagine that they'll be using objective indicators. I don't know. They, as I mentioned, they're using our data to develop their subjective indicator. And then they, they are developing their happiness policy screening tool. And so this is looking at working with you know all of the different levels of government using that policy screening tool. They also have another area of Smart Dubai, which is a really fascinating approach. I found it a little um, a little strange at first and then came to understand it that they what they do is they call their the people in Dubai, they call them their customers instead of citizens. Now, this is a country that has 90% expats. So every single person, when they have any kind of encounter with a government agency, they do a little survey of how happy they are. We'll see how they use that data to better provide services. 
um, I went past an ambulance and it had the happiness ambulance on it. So that made way. <laughs> I'm not happy. I need the ambulance. <laughs> I don't think that's what it was for. So, and then they they've convened a committee to advise them. And then they have they had this dialogue that was part of the World Government Summit. So it'll be really interesting to see what they're doing. We'd really like to work with you, Scott and I. We'd really like to know what you're doing and to gather the evidence so that countries can govern, truly govern for happiness, well-being, sustainability, and quality of life. Yeah, yeah. and I think I think it would be really useful for people that have been uh, spent time at the community level doing research all the way up to uh, governmental level and thinking about how these things would inform one another. A lot of the work that I do in communities, the policy recommendations come from the people that we work with. Um, and so I think it's an important voice to bring to the table and thinking about how we might use that information to inform higher level policies and things like that. Thank you so much, Scott and Laura, for that great presentation. We really appreciated that information. Um, I do want to remind everyone for further discussion, there is a, a special workshop that you're facilitating at the pre-conference uh, workshop. Could, would you mind talking a little bit about that? What we'd like to do, Scott, a student of his, his Stefan and I would like to really um, convene the people who are working in the field to, I, I, when I submitted for the workshop, I didn't think they would accept it because I said, it will be messy. <laughs> <laughs> really for us to, in, a, in, a sense to, in essence, to, um, to really get vulnerable and to figure out how, how can we really work together? What is our heart's desire? It's not going to be an academic workshop. It's going to be a workshop to figure out how we can really work together to further this movement. And if they're interested in uh, registering, what's the process there? They just need to contact you directly? Yeah, contact okay. Scott and me. Good. So I just want to remind everyone, thank you again, Laura and Scott. Um, I did notice, Laura, that you were mentioning John Hallowell, and I see that he's joined us here. So I don't know if you would like to have him say any words um, to the group. I know he's been. Uh, is that okay? I'm gonna unmute you, John. Is that Hi, John. <laughs> hi, hi, am I now audible? Yes. Yes, so we can hear you. <laughs> I, I was, I, I, the world descended on me, so I was a little late signing in. So I've been quiet. Well, really but, honored to have you. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to hear even that half the story, and I look forward to hearing more in September. I mentioned that I've been lobbying you for a um, a community section in the World mm -hmm. Happiness Report. Um, yeah. Encouraging it's, people to tell their stories. It's an important part of the uh, whole story, for sure. It's where most of the action is happening. Great. Thanks so much for joining. I'll, I'll mute you. Thanks so much. Bye. We would love to have you if you have not already joined or renewed your membership to ISQALS. You can do that uh, by going online to ISQALS.org, as well as uh, registering for our upcoming conference, uh, which is ISQALS2017.org. And that will be held again in Innsbruck, Austria, from September 26th, where you can participate in the pre-conference workshops. Um, and then the regular sessions will be from the 27th through the 30th.